Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Alberto, for your presentation. Um, I am just realizing how long I am living in Madison. So um, it's my, my, my town, actually, because I live here more than in my bird town. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I would like to, to share some reflections. Uh, about the bilingual education in the context of the Revolución Ciudadana in Ecuador. So I would like to, to focus on the silent war against indigenous language and, and knowledge in, in, my, in my country because it is the, the, um, the, the, the issue actually um, by neglecting the, um, not supporting the bilingual education in Ecuador. So, so I'd like to start with uh, uh, some paradoxes and questions about the uh, uh, Rafael Correa um, government. So, <coughs> uh, internationally, um, well, uh, Correa is in, in office since uh, January 15, uh, to 2007. Uh, uh, he was supported by the political movement uh, Alianza País, and uh, his uh, motto was uh, Revolución Ciudadana, the Citizen Revolution. So internationally, uh, um, uh, the government of uh, Revolución Ciudadana is uh, uh, um, it's calling the attention because of the Ecuadorian miracle. So um, uh, many scholars and many uh, universities and institutions are recognizing to uh, uh, this government uh, because uh, there are very uh, uh, huge and profound changes in the, in the country. So uh, uh, Correa uh, said in, when he visit, uh, visited uh, Harvard University, that democracy has been firmly established in Ecuador, not only democracy in the formal sense, but real democracy in terms of people's access to rights, equal opportunities, and dignified uh, living conditions. This is the so-called Ecuadorian miracle. So the government uh, itself has uh, assumed um, this, um, this um, <coughs> um, la label for itself. So uh, the government uh, is based, um, actions or programs are based on the program of Buen Vivir, the Good Living, the Plan Nacional of Good Living. Yeah, um, so, in, so this is a, this is a, a concept, uh, a translated concept from um, the Summa Causa. Yeah, yeah, just in the beginning, in the beginning of uh, the government, the more used the word was the summa causa, which is a Kichwa word, a Kichwa word um, uh, uh, trying to, to signify, to, to mean that uh, uh, a relationship with a, a cultural and civilizatory uh, uh, ways of the Andean, Andean peoples. But little by little, little by little, this... Uh, Kichwa, uh, Kichwa word was uh, abandoned in the, in the path, and now it is more uh, used, uh, the idea of uh, uh, buen vivir. And then everything, everything, uh, the pro progressive ideas are put in um, within this, this concept of buen vivir. Yeah, so uh, the, some, some facts. Um, so um, within this Plan Nacional del Buen Vivir, um, the extreme, uh, one of the um, um, uh, um, achievements of uh, this government is the extreme uh, poverty for the entire country has been reduced from 16.9% in um, 2000, 2000, 2006 to 8.6% um, uh, in the 2014. Yeah, the other thing is the government uh, 
uh, uh, investment and health uh, care during 2007-2014 has been nine million dollars. So it, it is the same thing in education, yet uh, two, two percent of uh, gross national product of Ecuador is being spent on higher education and uh, it is the second largest investment of any country in the world in higher, higher education other than Denmark. Okay, so it is, uh, it is just in higher education. Uh, and then uh, there, there is also a very huge investment in the other levels of uh, the educational system. So eight million, eight million uh, students have received the scholarships. No, 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 no. it is um, uh, eight, 8,000 students have received the scholarships to attend some, to the best schools in the world. So it is uh, scholarships for supporting um, uh, graduate students um, abroad. So um, thousands of students are uh, distributed in different universities uh, around the world. They are just uh, getting a master's degree or PhD uh, for returning to the country and um, uh, uh, support the universities at this moment. So, so the, there is a free education for, for all. So, um, uh, all children now get to go to the school for, for free. You know, uh, even though uh, it was uh, free education always, but usually the schools uh, used to, to charge uh, uh, some money for um, different uh, expenses in the schools. Um, yeah, it was not totally uh, free. Uh, but now the government is, um, is just uh, punishing the schools and the uh, high schools that are charging this uh, this uh, money. And then the government is pouring this, this money in the uh, schools uh, budgets. And then the university student uh, numbers have also soared thanks to, uh, thanks to free university education being guaranteed in the Constitution. Ecuador now has the second highest levels of public invest investment in higher education in the world. So by April 2012, in a far reaching effort to overhaul its higher education system, Ecuador closed 14 universities uh, that the government determined that uh, did not meet the basic academic standards. So it, is, uh, it was a good, uh, good thing because there, was, uh, there were more than uh, 100 universities in the country uh, doing anything uh, less than uh, educating uh, in an academic way to the university. It was called the uh, garage, garage University because it, uh, they were working in a particular house uh, even. So it was a disaster. So I, I, I knew this, this thing from two decades ago. Yeah, so in, the, um, in, in 2009, in nine it was uh, uh, pushed the first evaluation in, in the country and then in this year, 26 universities were closed by the CONEA, which is the Consejo Nacional de Evaluación. Uh, the, um, yeah, so, so um, within the Plan Nacional del Buen Vivir, yeah, the National Plan of Good Living, there was um, uh, uh, the good living is comprised of uh, 90, 93 goals, um, uh, 11 policies and uh, 150 strategies guidelines to be completed by the end of uh, President Correa's term in 2017. So it is a very huge and ambitious plan uh, of the government. So in this context, uh, so this, this, uh, this uh, few facts I have mentioned has um, <coughs> uh, uh, took to the international recognition of uh, educational achievements. So, so just uh, two cases that uh, Correa received uh, or was prized uh, uh, as a doctor honoris causa by the University of Chile, and uh, uh, the other doctor honoris causa by the University of Barcelona. Uh, you see there, I mean, he looks like Ginés uh, de Sepúlveda or something. Yeah. So, uh, and then the international institutions are speaking about the uh, uh, amazing Ecuadorian achievements in, in education in, in general. So in February uh, uh, 2008, Correa, 
तो बात ओके सो देर इज नॉट शोइंग एवरीथिंग सो हाउ एवर ऑफ दिस दिस फैक्ट सो देर आर सम कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इन द Uh, in Ecuador regarding the bilingual education so i have mentioned this uh, this uh, amazing uh, issues and uh, achievements just to contextualize the bilingual education so because there is a kind of contradictory contradictory policies um, in relation to the education in general but uh, uh, specifically in relation to the indigenous bilingual education so the first thing the first thing is that in february uh, 2000 eight uh, korea placed the national directorate of intercultural bilingual education yeah um, which was uh, uh, the top authority in bilingual education within the ministry uh, of education yeah um, uh, which um, has supported anti mining movement under control of the ministry of education uh, thus undermining its autonomy Yeah, so the DNIB, the National Directorate of Bilingual Education, was uh, um, an institution with a relative autonomy within the Ministry of uh, Education. Yeah, so this uh, autonomy was to um, to um, uh, design the curriculum, to uh, uh, produce uh, educational. Um, educational resources uh, textbooks etc so but it was always under the direction of the uh, ministry of education so um, so this is this is the other side uh, and then and then in general terms uh, uh, there is also a conflicting uh, relation with uh, conaie which is the the uh, biggest organization in uh, indigenous organization in the country which is the confederation confederation of national uh, nationalities indigenous nationalities of ecuador yeah so just to just to show you so one of the uh, current leaders of the conaie uh, said recently yeah yeah for us as indigenous peoples who have lived here for millennia it's not about having a big apartment with a plasma flat screen tv development means nothing to us if it doesn't protect the forest where our people have always lived or allow us to continue to have clean water forest and day and then it is um, uh, fighting against the uh, uh, mining polit- uh, policies of the government so or maybe he is uh, referring to the government interest in supporting the uh, quechua and uh, indigenous communities in the amazon just to reorganize the way of uh, uh, families living there uh, living in, in the in the jungle so this is a, this is an, exam- an example so the communities of the millennium so um, uh, the government is spending a lot of money just to organize this uh, these communities in the middle of the jungle if are using the um, um, the uh, oil revenues yeah yeah just to convince them uh, that permit um, that, that to permit to uh, exploit the petroleum or the oil and the, the jungle so this is España Cocha it's located in Sucumbíos yeah so the this all of this uh, communities or families living in this town were distributed through through the um, jungle in this place but now this is a kind of urban, uh, urbanized uh, or urbanized town it's a kind of modernization of uh, the communities so the official description of this picture says uh, the oil revenues enable the construction of the second millennium community paña coach so it's a kind of uh, propaganda just to to fight against the yasunidos which is a movement uh, against the mining exploitations and and uh, especially in, in the yasuni uh, uh, in the amazon Yeah so in uh, in this context so I I would like to um, to uh, present some some sociocultural and sociolinguistic aspects so this is my presentation uh, and brief uh, historical overview of bilingual education in the country 
and uh, an analysis of uh, bilingual education policies and practices focusing especially on language policies and planning and educational resources and curriculum policies uh, by the government. And I will finish it uh, by some conclusions and challenges for uh, um, bilingual education. Yeah, so um, uh, regarding the sociocultural and sociolinguistic aspects, aspects of Ecuador, so we have a, a population of um, almost uh, um, 15 million of uh, people, yeah, according to the census of uh, 2010. Um, within this uh, large population, so there are uh, 15, 15 indigenous nationalities, um, from which the Quechua, Quechua, Quechua uh, nationality it's uh, the the largest one, and then there are other uh, uh, indigenous communities which are very very uh, small. Uh, some of them here uh, with uh, a very few uh, uh, families. Um, yeah, and, uh, uh, they are very. Um, dangerous of uh, disappearing in, in the few next years. So, and then uh, the, uh, considering the indigenous uh, peoples and nationalities, it represents the 21% yeah, in the, in the, within the whole um, uh, national population. So this is the location, the location of indigenous nationalities. It's, uh, a little bit old, old map, but uh, the representation, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good. So the, you can see in the highlands, in the highlands in the middle, uh, it's uh, distributed the Quechua, Quechua uh, nationality or the Quechua communities, and there are other parts of uh, Quechua communities in the Amazon, in the Amazon with uh, different uh, dialects. And then the small uh, circles are representing the, the small nationalities in the Amazon and in the, in the coast. So here the estimations of uh, population is, uh, mm, is uh, uh, enlarged. So it's prepared by the CONAIE and the indigenous organizations and just, uh, for example, in Quechua, Quechua um, uh, community, it's uh, estimated at three, three million people. So it is a very contending issue, the, the statistics about the indigenous peoples. So, uh, yeah, so, mm, so each, each of these nationalities, or so these people, peoples have, has a, um, a, a different language and different culture and uh, located in different territories. So now the historical overview of bilingual education. So it is, it is very, very important because um, um, uh, the bilingual education was not a gift from the, any government. So it has a history, a very long history, but I would like just to, to mention some landmarks, um, um, especially in the, in the last, uh, last century. So uh, the concerns about indigenous, uh, indigenous education have been part of uh, elite discourses since colonial times. So usually the education was, um, was uh, thought as a, as a civilization, yeah? And then the Spanish, the Spanish language was the language of civilization. Yeah, so, um, um, so the, uh, in this context of the debates on indigenous education in the liberal revolution, it is yeah by the, end of the 19th, 19th century, uh, concluded that indigenous must be civilized by means of Castilian, Castilian, Castilianization, so Hispanization. Okay, so um, it was in the beginning of the 19th, 19th century, so the liberal revolution in Ecuador. So there were a uh, very huge, uh, intense debate about what to do with indigenous communities, indigenous peoples and their cultures or, uh, and language, and especially language, because uh, it was not considered that the indigenous had a uh, culture. Yeah? So what to do with indigenous language, considering that in this, in this time, so the majority, majority of the population were, was indigenous. Yeah, just the Quechua communities were more than mestizos, mestizos or, or blanco mestizos. Yeah, so uh, 
it is a, it, it has a, um, oh, there is a kind of uh, parallelism between the liberal revolution and the current government in Ecuador. So now there is a debate about indigenous language too, and uh, the Correa himself speaks uh, speaks a little bit a uh, little bit Quechua, and he is claiming uh, uh, always the indigenous uh, the indigenous uh, culture and language and. Uh, thinking about himself, I was very supportive to the, the language and uh, trying to speak in any event with indigenous peoples. And then in the liberal context, it was the, it was the same, but Alfaro and the liberal government did not speak um, uh, uh, Quechua, but there was a very, um, uh, very known and famous uh, expert in, in Quechua, uh, Luis Cordero, Luis Cordero Crespo. And he was uh, president of Ecuador too. And then um, he uh, wrote some Quechua dictionaries and compiled some Quechua, Quechua uh, songs and uh, poetry from Quechua communities. Uh, and he was uh, consulted uh, what to do with, uh, with Quechua uh, in the context of the revolution. And, and he said, Luis Cordero said, uh, Quechua, it's a very nice language. It is uh, similar to Latin. It's a very uh, ductile, uh, uh, nice, uh, sweet language. But you have to teach, to teach in Spanish because this is the language of civilization. Yeah? And then the, uh, uh, the liberal uh, uh, governments just uh, uh, order to the hacendados yeah, the landlords just to open schools within the haciendas just to, to, to educate uh, the workers and children in there. So it n never happened uh, uh, almost until the decade of the 1970s. So um, it is uh, it is some policies from, from above, right? So, um, but there was also a educational concern so concerns from below, and this is the more, imp more interesting thing. So uh, during the um, um, decades of uh, 19, 1940s uh, to 1960s, uh, there was uh, some indigenous schools. So it was not a bilingual school, it was indigenous schools in the sense that these schools were um, uh, uh, taught uh, by uh, Quechua teachers who uh, uh, taught in, in, in Quechua language. So using the language, the Quechua language as, as language of instruction. Yeah? Um, and this was a project uh, yeah, supported by, by the uh, leftist parties and especially the communist party in, the, in Ecuador. Yeah? Um, so a group of uh, teachers were uh, trained by, by the leftist, leftist experts uh, teachers and then uh, they used to teach in the, within the haciendas uh, sometimes uh, uh, in a clandestine way because the hacendados were always persecuting these uh, this, uh, this schools. But they didn't have money, uh, they, they didn't have money uh, just as to, keep, uh, to keep working, but they uh, lasted uh, almost two, uh, uh, 20 years. So by the beginning of the 1960s, these uh, uh, schools of Dolores Cacuang, who, who was a leader of the uh, uh, communities of uh, the northern Ecuador, just were uh, uh, assumed by the, by the state yeah, uh, and became uh, state schools. So the... Um, um, so in the um, uh, second half of the uh, 1960s, 